Hi, welcome to this ESMARCONF 2023 panel discussion um, on the benefits and challenges of taking part in a hackathon. This session was pre-recorded because of the speaker availability, and now you're watching on YouTube. Um, automatic subtitles should be available now, and we'll work hard to get these manually verified as soon as possible. If you have any questions from our presenters, you can ask them via the at ES Hackathon Twitter account by commenting on the tweet about this session. If you've registered for this con conference, you can also comment and chat with other participants in our dedicated Slack channel. We will endeavor to answer all questions soon after the event. We would also like to take time to draw your attention to the code of conduct available at the ESMARConf website at www.esmarconf.org. This panel discussion will include members from previous hackathons, and they'll be speaking about what it means to take part in a hackathon and what can be produced collectively. My name is Trevor Riley, and I am the head of reference and research services at NOAA Central Library. Um, I will be um, the moderator today. Um, today, we have panel members, including uh, Adam Dunn, Matthew Granger, and Allison Bethel. So we will start um, by allowing folks to introduce themselves. Um, and we'll start with Adam. Um, Adam, can you introduce yourself and then also give us an idea of what hackathons uh, you've been involved in in the past? Sure. Um, so thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Adam Dunn. I'm a professor of biomedical informatics at the University of Sydney, and I'm also the head of biomedical informatics and digital health at the university, um, which is in the School of Medical Sciences and the Faculty of Medicine and Health. Um, I am originally a computer scientist, um, so, but that was a very, very long time ago. Um, and I think the first hackathon I was actually involved in, um, if I'm looking through my records, was around 2018, where I was a judge, not a participant. Um, and then I was involved in the evidence synthesis hackathon um, in Canberra uh, in 2019, um, where I was uh, a participant of sorts. Um, and um, have since then also been a judge on hackathons, contributed data to hackathons, um, judged hackathons and so on. Um, so rarely a participant and often a judge. That's interesting. I, I haven't heard much about judging um, in hackathons, but uh, maybe we can dive into that a little bit too. Um, uh, Matt, um, uh, same question in terms of how, how, how did you get uh, started in hackathons and uh, introduction? Hi, yep, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm Matt Granger. I'm a researcher at the Norwegian Institute for Nature Research, NINA, uh, based in Trondheim in central Norway. Uh, I'm an ecologist by training, uh, but also have a strong interest in um, evidence synthesis and uh, making tools to help people. Um, I started off at the ES Hackathon in 2018 in Stockholm um, with yeah, working on the um, Evi Atlas project uh, there. And yeah, it was, it, from there, I've carried on doing uh, several different hackathons, all to do with evidence since this, in that, all, all in that realm. Awesome. So it's a nice mix, um, health sciences and ecology. I like it. Um, and we have um, our last panel member, Alison Bethel. Um, and Alison, um, what what role have you played in hackathons and what got you started? Um, and and uh, uh, introduction as well. Uh, thanks, Trevor. Uh, so yeah, I'm Alison Bethel and I'm an information specialist. So um, a bit different to Matt and Adam. Um, and I work for the University of Exeter, uh, the medical school, and I work in a team called the Evidence Synthesis Team. So we undertake evidence uh, synthesis, systematic reviews, evidence and gap maps, that kind of thing. And my role is to find the evidence as an information specialist. And I got involved in the hackathon. The first, the first one was in 2019 at Canberra, like uh, Adam. And I got involved through... Um, I won't bore you with the long story, but I was at uh, a conference in Paris on environmental evidence uh, through one of my colleagues, Ruth Garside, some projects I was involved in with her. Um, but prior to becoming an information specialist at X University, I did work as a librarian at the Environment Agency. So that's how I ended up involved in the environmental field. Um, and while I was at the conference, 
I met and saw some presentations by Martin Meskey and Neil Hadaway. So we had some chats afterwards and then that's how I kind of got involved in, in the hackathon. Um, and I was involved last year uh, doing a, uh, presenting a workshop on searching. That's wonderful. Um, it's really interesting. Everybody is, uh, you know, not too new, but also doesn't have a, a, a long experience in, in hackathons. So I, I, this is this is great. I think a lot of our viewers um, will will really love to hear the feedback on 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 this session. So um, let's uh, do round robin here and talk about the difference between maybe a hacker and a coder, right? So being a part of a hackathon, um, you know, what role, if you could dive a little bit deeper into what role you've played um, in the hackathon and whether you see yourself as a, you know, strictly doing in terms of hackathons, a hacker or, or a coder and what that might mean for, to you. Um, let's start um, with Allison. Yeah, I'm definitely not a coder. That's not my my bag at all. Um, uh, so the role I played in 2019, it was interesting because you had the, the, the coders in one room and then you had the others in the other room. So there was a lot of discussion about evidence synthesis and Adam can probably pitch in here as well because he was in the room too, um, talking about the, the process of evidence synthesis and systematic reviews and at what points um, perhaps that um, a tool or coding would be able to help um, within that whole process, I would say. Yeah, I don't know if Adam wants to add more to that. I'm happy to jump in next and 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 for sure. Um, yeah, so I was in the same position. Um, I, I, uh, even though I'm originally a computer scientist, I probably wouldn't call myself a coder anymore. It's been a long time since I've really had um, any any chance to do any real coding. Um, but um, but yeah, no, I was in that room. I, I actually joined the Evidence Synthesis Hackathon and, and um, went along with a software engineer from my group, um, Paige Martin. Um, and so she was involved in the in the, the the coders room essentially um and working on a, um at least one or two tools i think um as part of the hackathon um but interestingly you know we think about the products that come out of these hackathons and one of the products that came out or tools things that came out of the the evidence synthesis hackathon in 2019 um was a paper that alice and i are both co-authors on um which was on a new ecosystem for evidence synthesis um, published in Nature, Ecology and Evolution. Um, and that was really um, um, still created um, in that room as we were having discussions on what needs to happen um, uh, in to make changes, I guess, in how we do evidence synthesis. Um, I believe it was also a relatively successful hackathon from the perspective of tool building. Um, because I think some of the tools that were built in the room at the time were also went on to um, quite a lot of success. So, um, you know, you don't have to just be coding when you're at a hackathon. I think that's that's the really good fun part of hackathons is that you everyone has something to contrib contribute to, and it's a you don't have to be the best coder, you don't have to be the, the most knowledgeable, but there's a little bit that you can do, and it's joining together and working together. And, and I enjoyed that. Uh, that's why I sort of I, I became addicted to, to ES Hackathon uh, events was because of that. You know, the, in Stockholm, we had real like computer scientists who had built the tool before we'd even stopped talking about it. And then and, and, you know, the academics were able to to sort of talk a, a lot about what, what things should be. And the tool was being built as we we're doing it. So it's a really good uh, way of collaborating. I, re I really enjoyed it. Yeah, and I, I remember I always used to t uh, to tell repeatedly tell Neil and Shinichi that um, it was probably the most fun experience I'd had traveling for a for a conference or hackathon or for anything um, for the last few years. It was it was actually really um, you know a lot of fun. And um, that same year, I actually was a judge in a hackathon um, in Malaysia, um, which was digital health related. And in this case, um, the, the, the hackathon was actually for um, a whole bunch of students from across uh, computer science and medicine um, to get together and, and build solutions to problems in the real world. 
Um, and I was there to, to help decide which of the tools was the best and would actually receive funding to, to be built for real. Um, so that was quite amazing as well. But I wanted to pause for a second and ask um, Trevor, um, you, you know, you, you haven't told us yet what your um, uh, hackathon experience is and whether or not you're a coder hacker or otherwise. I don't think that's fair. I'm the moderator, but no. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I, I went back and actually listened to some panels from last last year, maybe even the year before, and I was listening to Martin Westgate about his work and all the packages he's worked on, and he talked about feeling like you step into a room and everybody says they feel like they're unqualified to be there. And I think that was the epitome of what I felt when I put forward an idea for what will be site source. Um, and we got a, a session um, at this year's conference and I had no R experience at all. I think I had run lit searcher maybe one time unsuccessfully, but I, and so I ended up using the shiny. I don't see myself as a coder. I think I the co I think I would say a coder is somebody who is doing it every day, and a, and a, and maybe somebody who's a hacker is is doing it more collaboratively. It's just a piece; they're a piece of the puzzle. Um, and so, yeah, that that's where I see myself as maybe a hacker, borrowing, you know, uh, learning constantly, um, really in, in that regard. And um, yeah, my my first experience was last year's hackathon which was all virtual, completely different uh, from, I think, any any of the earlier hackathons. But it was the way that I was able to get in the door because I probably wasn't able to travel, you know, to to Europe to, to do some just for coding anyway. So um, I think that uh, this new environment actually brings more people in and, and, and we may be able to get more hackers and, um, involved. So, um, but that being said, like how I got involved, you know, I had an idea. Um, I really wanted to see it through um, and Neil helped make that happen. But what made you all say yes to getting involved in projects? Because it's not something small, right? It's a, it's a substantial amount of time. Um, it can be long-term projects. So what made you say yes and continue saying yes um, to these projects? Um, and let's, let's start with Matt because, he, you know, You've, you've been on so many of these um, projects. I think that the, the reason I said yes was um, to learn more about code and learn more about uh, evidence synthesis at the time. Um, the reason I continue to say yes is because it's really good fun uh, and you do get some outputs you know there, there are academic outputs and and, and tools that, that are developed and that's that's nice to be able to feel that you you can actually make a difference and help people so that's why yeah i continue to say yes and adam and allison you have any any uh thoughts on that initial yes maybe um and then and then that continuation with projects as well Um, me, I think in evidence synthesis, the search lends itself really well doing the search to, to having some uh, kind of coding or app to help you do it. And I have lots of ideas because <laughs> having done it for over 10 years, I keep thinking, oh, if only I could do X, you know, and I don't have the skills. So um, being linked up with other people who have the skills and also the dialogue between people is really interesting. Um, although when you come back from it, you know, so, you know, it is like um, we were saying earlier, Trevor, it's time sometimes. Is it, you have to think of it as a very long term thing, you know, because everyone's doing it um, kind of on top of their day job. So, yeah. I, I think I was probably a little bit reluctant um, to, to join in and because I didn't think I'd be able to contribute anything. But the reason I said yes in the first place was because of the people. Um, because I like the people and so they asked me and of course I had to say yes um, because they were very nice. Um, I left the, the 2019 hackathon um, just blown away by the amount of work that actually gets done and um, just by comparison. Um, I also, I'm, I'm an interim trustee and I sit on a membership panel for a society called the Society of Research Synthesis Methodology um, and um, you know it's a, it's a, it's a fine meeting um, where everybody presents their ideas, 
Um, and I learn a lot of interesting things and I meet some quite amazing, brilliant people from around the world. Um, but, you know, it's not quite the same as, as um, leaving there, knowing that the tools that were built on, you know, during those days are going to be used for forever, hopefully, or for a very long time in the future. Um, it's a, it's a different kind of experience to turning up for an annual meeting or a conference and, um, you know, not that those are bad, but this is just a lot more fun. I think one thing I'd like to add is the, the collaborative kind of aspect to it that is really important, um, as well as everything being open access as well. I think that, that is, um, it's one of the drivers, I think, for still being involved in it. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is. Uh, it's it's pretty exciting to know that those tools um, are going to be open, are going to be used by the community. Um, yeah, it's it's really fantastic, and being able to to meet other other like minded people who who really do want to move move this area forward. So that's great. Um, so along with these um, these positive aspects of hackathons. Um, what would you say are some challenges that you have faced during hackathons and how have you overcome those challenges? Um, and Adam, do you want to start uh, this one? Yeah, for sure. Um, look, there wasn't a particular challenge that needed to be overcome with the, the evidence synthesis hackathon that I attended. Um, but um, there was something that I was, I was thinking about when we were, when we were planning for this, uh, this panel. Um, and it was that, the hackathons that I felt didn't work as well were the ones where everybody was trying to answer exactly the same research question and then just do it better than everybody else. And those are the ones that were judged and where, where people weren't coming up with new, new innovative solutions that were just, you know, achieve the best accuracy on this particular machine learning problem. Um, and so they would all compete with each other to produce the best solution there'd be some prizes at the end of it, you know, the people who got the best solution were then invited to sort of write it up and, and they didn't work very well. The solutions weren't great. Um, I feel like the experts in a room could have easily done a better job without having to run a hackathon. Um, and the ones that worked particularly well were the ones where it was go for it. You know, it was just, you know, um, there are a million different problems that we need to solve pick one that suits you and that you're interested in, join together with other people that have the same problem and, and build something cool and fun. Um, and so I think if there was a challenge, it would be the framing of, the, of what it, we're meant to do in the hackathon and the way to solve that, it would be to change the framing to be build cool tools. That's a great tagline. I like that. Build cool tools. Um, but in terms of the judging, if I can jump in before others um, uh, just continue along, along this line of thought, how were they judged? Um, were you looking at the concept, the idea, and and, and judging um, that, or was it really just based on what the output was by, at the end of the hackathon? Uh, in that, in one of the ones that I that I judged before, um, not the one in Malaysia, it was actually at a, another university in Australia. Um, it was based on half on the performance of the model um, in a machine learning model at the end of the day. Um, and it was also half based on the quality or creativity of the solution. So um, it was those two things, but everybody was answering the same question um, and they were there to get the prize money. It was kind of a bit like a shared task. If you know from computer science, that's the, the way people compete in shared tasks to get the best performance. Um, and so I, I felt like that didn't work as well as, as a much more free and open approach. Thanks, Adam. And uh, Matt and Allison, in terms of challenges that you have, you know, encountered during um, projects and how you've overcome them, can you think of any specifics? For it's personal challenges. So, uh, as we already mentioned, not not feeling good enough. Um, so, not it's because there's always someone in the room who's a hell of a lot better at coding than you are, and a hell of a more knowledgeable about evidence synthesis than you are. Um, but it's 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 about letting those go and realizing you do have a role to play. And even if it's just 
testing someone's code you know you can do something to help writing documentation whatever it might be um i found that a bit of a challenge at the start i think um but when you realize that people are very very friendly and very very open and and um they don't really care if you can't code that well uh, then actually it's it's yeah it's less of a challenge it's, it's more of a personal thing to get over yeah i think probably the same for me but also um being the only information specialist in the in the room uh in canberra that was a bit um a challenge for me i think um because my my experience was so different, I guess, to others. Other people obviously search, but <laughs> don't spend their whole day doing it. Um, yeah, so, but no, it's, you know, there are other um, librarians and information professionals involved in it. So I think that makes, you know, I'm involved in a project that uh, Trevor maybe mentioned earlier. Um, so that makes the conversations a little bit easier because we, we both understand, you know, um, you know the, the same language we're speaking the same language so that i think that's certainly helpful i think it's one of the things about evidence synthesis isn't it that that we tend to be extremely multidisciplinary you know um by the nature of what we're trying to do you know you're going to have people from every different kind of discipline in the room um coding experience or not coding experience i mean a lot of the people in the in the area um, we're all using r and uh, I'm certainly not an R coder. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I think the, 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 the nice thing about having people who work in areas like information as an information specialist and other areas where um, you're kind of forced to be a conduit for lots of different disciplines at once, like in order to be able to do a good job of searching, you kind of need to be an expert in every other discipline at the same time. Um, and so I think that having people in the room who are good conduits between different areas um, is a is a really valuable thing. And, and I think we need more of those people at hackathons for sure. No, this is great. I think, um, yeah, go, um, going off that first, the personal challenges and also playing that unique role. Um, what, what Matt said about, again, like just maybe not feeling adequate enough or, you know, not feeling like you have enough um, to, to bring to the table, but really, you know, the ideas you're bringing from your unique roles, like um, the ideas that Allison's bringing as an information professional, you know, I'm a librarian as well, right? Um, and we deal with particular parts of the evidence synthesis process, but we're, we're deep in it, right, every day. And so I think that that can bring um, a lot of value. So, um, yeah, the, this is that's really interesting. I, it reminds me a little bit about the, the uh, Seth Godin shipping creative work. I, um, I don't know, I'll throw that out there for anybody who's, who is feeling like they are not bringing enough to the table. It's a fantastic, um, fantastic book to read. Um, let's see. So when um, when we're thinking about hackathons, um, we're normally thinking about developing tools, right? Um, but what might be some other useful things that hackathons um, can create or can come out of hackathons? Um, Adam, you spoke a little bit about um, the paper that, that you and Allison um, had, had co-authored. Um, can you talk more about that and maybe talk about maybe some other um, aspects um, of hackathons that um, you think are good in terms of creation? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear Alison's take on on um, what she found the, the experience like. I remember um, at the 2019 um, uh, Evidence Synthesis um the, the room was filled with um, um, some relatively loud people. And I feel like I might have been one of those loud people. Um, so I so I'd be interested to hear what Alison thought about the experience of of um, coming up with you know um, these kind of ideas that which would that we need to do to be able to shape the future of evidence synthesis um, is something that I've been thinking about a lot for a long time. Um, you know I've been writing papers in the area since uh, 2011, um, and um, and uh, yeah no it was a really interesting experience uh, to to have ideas from all around the world from every different discipline um, this is how we do it 
this is no you're wrong <laughs> you know <laughs> we need these standards no let's just do this you know it was a it was a it was a really interesting um kind of debate that we had around um ideas you know and um i guess if you think about it from a large scale um the ideas that we were discussing and debating in that room um, it would have been great if we were able to have those discussions in right in the same room where people were building tools. Because if you have my, for, for my money, the best tools that we can build right now are the ones that improve the synthesizability of primary research that, that um, you know, um, make things more robust and fairer. You know, there's certainly tools that you can build that help you fix a single tiny part of the process but the best tools are the ones that break those processes open. Um, and I think that's a lot of the stuff that we were talking about in the other room. Uh, and it'd be nice if there was some more cross fertilization with those things as well, I think. But anyway, I, look, I, I talked too long. I want Alison to answer. No, I probably didn't do have much more. To add. I remember we were you see there were loud voices, but then we were split up into groups. So, you know, in the smaller groups, people felt, you know, me perhaps felt more comfortable to speak within a smaller group because uh, I guess someone who with um, less experience like myself being there, you kind of defer to those like yourself, Adam, who's, you know, you've been thinking about this for a long time. And actually what you're saying, you go, oh, yes, that's true, you know. So it's just in in one way, it's voicing what other people are thinking anyway. So I, I don't think, I don't I don't really recall that being, <laughs> being, being an issue. I think everyone felt their voice, their voice was valid. Yeah. Which is, you know, that collaborative approach. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, one of the other things that we, we should be discussing more about and some of the things that I know are of interest to, to other people in the in the evidence since the hackathon is really around the the kind the other the things that we can do to support better quality evidence synthesis in the community for everyone. Um, so we often think about things like checklists and standards and and tools that don't require any code at all. Um, and th those kinds of things can be really, really useful. Um, but I think they're, they're useful when they're in tandem with the, it, with the kinds of tools that make that are available and that are easy to use for everyone. You know, we know there are right ways to do systematic reviews. And we also know that probably less than 1% of systematic reviews actually follow all of those rules, right? Um, so I want to see the tools. I want to see the ideas, the checklists and the standards that I wouldn't say democratize um, systematic reviews or evidence synthesis or meta-analysis, but, but um, at least make it easier for everyone to do the right thing. Um, and I think those are the things that can really come out of hackathons when you get those people talking about ideas and the people building tools aligned. No, I like that. I think... Um in terms of hackathons, sometimes it's like, this is a hackathon for evidence synthesis, go. And without maybe some more guidance on, let's make things more useful for people, right? Like, let's let's take what we have already and improve the Shiny app so that, you know, folks can really, you know, do the work um, it, without knowing R. I think that that was one of the big things I was worried about last year when we got started is not knowing everything. You know, I had reached out to Eliza Grahams, um, who did Lit Searcher Write, and I said, hey, really, I love your package. I can't use it. And then she put together Shiny, and it was, it, it, it made it, it opened up my world, and that really, like, brought me in. So I think that that's, that's right on, Adam, in terms of, like, bringing these tools, opening them up, and that, um, that cross-collaboration um, that Allison had mentioned, too. Um, I, think, I think that might be something that is particular or a bit special about um, the Evidence Synthesis Hackathon as well. Um, I mean, Matt, is your you, you've been to a bunch of these? Um, is your is your feeling that that the kind of the openness and the making it available to as many people as possible to do the right thing is part of the what would you call it the ethos or the or the or the, the undercurrent of the entire hackathon? Definitely, I would say it is the ethos of of the hackathon it is to to make tools that people can use that aren't reliant on someone's coding skills or, or even, even their understanding of systematic reviews to a certain extent. Maybe we try and make sure that people have some background knowledge available 
uh, Neil will make a video to, to go with the tool to help people to understand why they're doing it and what they're doing. So I think all that is, yeah, it's a really important aspect of it. And I think it's easy for us to forget uh, that. But as a team, we're often very, uh, as you said, inter interdisciplinary, different types of people coming together. And I think that's important because the problems we face may quite be quite similar across different fields, but there's some things that are worse or better in other disciplines than, than, than others, you know? And I think it's an understanding of that whole, yeah, the, the whole array of different problems you might face is really useful when you come to design these tools for, for a bigger group of people. It's not just for health professionals or ecologists or whoever, it's for everyone who uses uh, evidence synthesis tools. Yeah, I, I, wonder, I wonder how many, what proportion of hackathons are like that because, you know, I have, albeit limited experience with hackathons, but I've certainly been at hackathons where it's been a competition to find the most commercializable um, tool that everybody's keeping secret within their little um, super group of, of talented coders because they know at the end of the hackathon there's an opportunity for for um, funding for their, their idea and, and it's going to help them become successful and rich or whatever it is that they want to do. Um, and I know that the evidence synthesis hackathon is absolutely not like that. Um, so I wonder how, how many hackathons are like that and um, if there's maybe something a little bit special about the evidence synthesis hackathon. But, but saying that, if someone does want to give us some money, then please do. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna pull up my checkbook here, Matt. Um, but uh, in terms of in terms of making a, a hackathon successful, right? Like last last year when we were fully remote and we and we did this hackathon, it was really challenging, right? I think that um, in terms of the new the new normal, right? Um, working across you know uh, entire continents um, across the world, you know we're we're really challenged by not being able to sit in the same room. Um, the hackathon for site source was maybe a couple hours and then everybody kind of went their own ways and it, it's been over an entire year just going, you know, weekly meetings um, and bi-weekly meetings. How can we make hackathons um, in this more modern world where we're, where we're collaborating in different time zones, how can we actually make them more successful and then also ensure that they continue into the future? Because these aren't, no one's getting paid here, right? No one, um, no one is, is, uh, is required to continue along with a project. What would you say bring, you know, keeps bringing people to the table and how can we continue to make these successful? Matt, do you have insight into, I mean, you've, you've, you've created so many packages through the evidence of the sackathons. Do you have any insight into, you know, which of those, how, how it worked in terms of keeping those projects going um, and continuing to develop them? What do you feel was the common denominator in terms of the success? Yeah, I think the, the main thing is having a driving force. And um, for SiteSource, Trevor, you're the driving force behind that. You're, you're reminding us that we should be doing something and uh, sorry I haven't but uh, we should be doing more and you're, you're there just that constant reminder of the process um, I think having tools like github um, for example has allowed people to work together uh, but not necessarily at the same time which is quite useful for these sort of um, yeah remote uh, hackathons but there is something to be said for having a short period of time in in place together i think that brings maybe um yeah it, it sort of brings things closer together faster and i think there's a different experience between the two uh, i've enjoyed both approaches um and i think yeah the world we're in now it, it's, it's i can't really afford to fly off to america or fly to australia um i can yeah i can get a train to stockholm but that's about it but it's um yeah i think it, it's pretty better for the environment and better if we work together using systems online so, um, github is one that i know very well so that's something that i'm very comfortable with uh, there's obviously a barrier there of learning how to use github but i think <clears throat> you can probably talk about that trevor how, how you've actually learned to do that um, and, and i think that's something that, that does help these sort of disparate groups of people to work together in the same thing and it's i think we all have the same goal is to get a good product done so that helps as well everyone's motivated
You go. All right. Yeah, Alison, Adam. Um, I was I was just I was just reflecting on what you were saying, and I wondered if I, I think it is harder when people aren't in the same room. Um, but I wondered if there was an opportunity, like Matt said, if you get a train to Stockholm, you know, I can too, you know. So maybe there are centres in different places all at the same time, and you know, it's a bit of a hybrid thing. But you've got protected time then you know if people come to you know one institution say in Europe that it's easy for people in Europe to get to or in Australia and the States or something like that but all on the same in the same week or something that that's a potential it's a hybrid and you're not it's not a hybrid on you know you're not on your own then it's just a suggestion really <laughs> Hybrid is really tough. We run, um, uh, so I'm a convener for a network called Digital Health and Informatics Network. It's got a thousand people in it, and we run a, a like a conference every every year called Digital Health Week. Um, and it started at University of Sydney um, and has grown to include University of Melbourne, UNSW, and and will continue to grow to include lots of universities around Australia. Beautiful thing about the conference is that it was free this year. Um, and it's usually, you know, very cheap to turn up to um, and submit papers to. Um, hybrid is really tough. Um, so we try and hold in-person events at each of the locations um, on different days. Um, and, um, you know, it's just a struggle to get a whole bunch of people in a lecture theatre and then have twice as many of those people online watching and all that sort of stuff. So hybrid can be tough. But I was actually thinking about um, there was that paper um, that was written about um, uh, the impact of of um, of uh, working online on innovation, and if I remember correctly, the the conclusion of that paper was that um, uh, working online has has made it harder for people to be innovative, but it's actually quite useful for just getting stuff done. And so I, I wonder if maybe the the right way to think about this is not. Um, not should we meet or should we not meet for a hackathon. It's about how can we structure an in-person hackathon to be most useful? Um, because you don't need to just get stuff done at a hackathon, but what you do need is the time to uh, sit and discuss ideas and come up with innovative solutions because according to the paper, at least, um, that is what's required is that in-person discussion and talking to, to come up with these innovative new ideas. Um, and then when it's time to get stuff done, of course, you can, you can do that from um, the luxury of your own home at whatever time you like and, and then uh, just push, that, push those changes through to GitHub, easy. Um, so I think maybe, maybe the, the structure of hackathons just needs to be rethought about in terms of what you spend your prior time, you know, what what kinds of things you prioritize for in during a hackathon, I think is probably probably one way to think about it. Yeah, I'm gonna leave the coding at home and just bring the ideas almost. I I, I like that. I, I think I mean, that I mean I've never been to a conference to actually list to listen to the talks. It's always to go out to dinner with friends. That's that's it. It's the only reason to go to a conference, right? I mean, it's it's it, it is one it is one nice aspect, right? <laughs> All right. Um, so that that kind of leads into an, another question. Um, if if you could develop a, a new structure, then um, Adam, I think I I'd like to continue down that line of thought. If you could create a, a new structure for a hackathon um, from the from the ground up, what might it look like? Is it is it going to be purely um, conversation, logistics for how how the project is going to continue into the future. What would be the main parts that it, that you would want a hackathon to, to cover them? I'm I'm clearly not qualified to answer that question. I I think I've I've been to a few that that worked and a few that didn't. Um, I know what parts I enjoyed. I was just happy to be there. To be honest, um, I'll leave that for the experts. I don't think I'm an expert either. Either so, um, <laughs> but I think that I think some of the the aspects that are really good is the community feeling. So either that's online or in person. I think it's having a community and feeling like a community is really important for me, at least, uh, in in 
engaging in these in these projects. And if you can maintain that, um, whichever way you can, uh, and yeah, in person, uh, and as Alison said, maybe these sort of subgroups of people uh, internationally would be very useful. But still, having to you still need a, a component of online work um, to get that sort of global connectivity. But that's not. I mean. COVID's taught us one thing is that we can work online, we can meet online, and we're sat here on Zoom now, uh, talking across different continents. So we can do it, and it's, I think it's, um, yeah, it may not be as as touchy feely, and we may not have, be able to have a beer together, but um, we can at least uh, get get stuff done, and, and it's good stuff we're doing. All right, awesome. Yeah, I know, um, Matt. I would definitely like to buy you a beer for all of the all of the work you've done on on site source. <laughs> so, um, all right. So let's um, let, let's wrap up with one last question. And um, yeah, for for our viewers um, who may be considering um, taking part in a hackathon, um, what advice um, would each of you give? Um, a listener, and this could be from your own unique perspective as, as an information professional or um, any way you'd like it, but um, what advice would you, would you give somebody? We'll start, with, we'll start with Matt. I was going to say, just do it. Just join up. Don't be frightened. There's, uh, you, you can't break things. You can't ruin the, the whole project. You know, and anything you can, any small part of, of what you give is going to be really useful and really helpful. Um, so don't worry about your skill levels or anything like that. Just apply and go for it. I think um, if I was going to give any, any advice, it would be to leave your work at home. Um, to, to sort of embrace the opportunity to, to, to spend dedicated amounts of time on this and that doesn't just mean during the day it also means you know networking at night and hanging out with everybody and talking to them if you're in person um and i think it's also there's also something important there about um your obligation to to make sure that the environment is an inclusive safe um respectful one as well and I think it's really important that um, if you're a participant in a hackathon, that you, you know, make sure that the environment is like that for everybody else, um, that you don't just leave it up to the organisers to make sure that they set that culture and that tone, but that you live and act in that tone as well. Um, it was the beauty of the evidence synthesis hackathon. Um, you know, I always felt included and safe and respected um, in my opinions and how I was and who I was. And I think that that was always the case with, um, I hope that was the case for everybody at the hackathon as well. And I think that's kind of, an, kind of one of the things that I would suggest people um, to, to remember when they're visiting a hackathon for sure. Yeah, I don't think I can add anything else. Oh, that, that was, um, yeah, like Matt said, just go for it. Um, and what you you will have something to offer, you know, I think. And you know, from what Adam said there, then you know, people people will listen to you. Yeah. All right, awesome. Yeah, I, th I think I think Matt, just do it. I like that. Um, even if you're just gonna show up to listen. Because you, you could be right, you could be, you'd be very in, intimidated about the entire process. Um, but if you if you just join in and and listen, um, there's going to be one thing that you can at least provide some insight into um, from from your perspective. And and whether or not um, it gets taken up, you're still you know you're still hearing how the process works. Um, and how, how people take on different roles. Um, and you also learn a lot about even good, good coders, um, good hackers, right? They, they are coming and saying like, well, I don't really know how to build a shiny app or I don't know how to, how to do this part, but I know how to do that, that part. And so you can understand how people have their own niches even within, um, within that, the process. So um, I think that I love the idea, just do it um, if you're thinking about it. Um, 
I'm, I'm really thankful to have had the, the time to spend um, with, with you all today. Um, and I hope that the, the listeners have um, gotten a lot out of it. Um, just to, to wrap things up, I think, you know, a lot of what we've talked about is um, that community aspect. Um, from, from the discussion, you know, hearing everybody talk about, you know, that constant learning, um, just putting yourself out there and how a lot of this is shifting too. We, we kind of have an understanding of what a hackathon is, um, but evidence that this hackathon is something different too. Um, it's, it's not something that you're going to be judged on. It's, it's, it's really about producing those tools for the community and um, how everybody has a seat at the table. Um, and I love that, Adam, about just um, making sure you are um, acting in, in, you know, always in a way to in, in include people um, and help them up because um, that's what we, we need more of that, and, you know, across the board. So I, I love that. And um, I, in terms of Allison's um, perspective of being an information professional as a librarian, I've got the same thing too, right? It's like um, you're, you're approaching it from such a what feels like a weird perspective when you're when you're hearing everybody else talk, um, but we each have that, and I think it's important to to keep that in mind that everybody has something um, to bring to the table. So, um, any any last words before uh, we wrap up from anyone? All right, awesome. So, um, thank you for everybody um, joining this uh, panel on the benefits and challenges of taking part of the hackathon. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Um, and thank you to Adam, Matt, and Allison, um, and we'll see you at our next session. Thank you.